Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we Today, we have the privilege of having a conversation, a fireside chat uh, with someone who's on the front lines. Um, as you know, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, hospitals have been on the front lines dealing with death and sickness and all of these things. And so we have some folks that have been on the front line throughout this pandemic and leading the charge. Um, not only that, but this person that we are introducing will also have a conversation about how Deep Free is used internally and externally within her organization. I am talking about none other than Micheline Davis Esquire, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at RWJ Barnabas Health. She will be having a fireside chat and an intimate conversation with our Executive Director, Tamika N. Stembridge Esquire. Shonda, thank you so much for that introduction. And Micheline, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to be here. Um, when we found out that RWJ Barnabas Health was going to be one of our sponsors, I was one, very excited about the sponsorship, but also just really excited to talk to you because I mean, who better to talk about being on the front lines than yourself, given all that we're going through. So, you know, I know who you are, but before we jump right in, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your connection to D3? So thank you, Tamika. Um, I so appreciate an opportunity to spend uh, any time with you and the D-Free family. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I have the fortunate opportunity and blessing to drive um, uh, uh, social impact and community investment across the state's largest academic medical center system um, at RWJ Barnabas Health. We are an incredibly large um, uh, and very diverse system with both urban and suburban hospitals um, with a fantastic team who um, have been there every step of the way through this incredible pandemic, um, but who showed up every day, day in and day out to make certain that the families, communities um, that we serve, um, that they would make it through that pandemic as well. And so while there's been a great deal of loss as a result of that, um, there's still a great deal of hope because of the fortunate opportunity that I have had to work with uh, these incredible uh, um, individuals. Excellent, excellent. So one of the things that I always, um, I love to talk about, um, especially when I'm talking to Black women, is really the whole concept of intersectionality. You play so many roles on so many different areas that we're working in. And so given our conference theme from crisis to clarity, when we talk about being on the front lines, you're right there in it. So given all your roles, both personally and professionally, you're literally at the front lines of everything that's happening today, both from a race standpoint, gender standpoint, you know, healthcare, you know, economics, all of it, you're right in the middle. I have to ask you though, how are you? How are you, how is Micheline doing in the midst of all of this? <laughs> Thank you so much for the sister care, first of all. Um, that's a, it's a rarity for someone to ask that question, as well as a rarity for um, anyone to, to observe and notice. Um, the, the varied impact of everything that we're going on. I, I do not believe that anyone at the top of January of 2020 would have uh, known that they would be at this stage in both a global pandemic and an international revolution. Nor do I know whether or not any of us would have raised our hand to say, pick me, pick me. Um, uh, that being said, uh, it is really uh, uh, just God-given grace that we find ourselves on this side of the ground and on this planet at exactly right now. And so I keep uh, reminding myself that uh, we can make it through because we've made it over before. Uh, we wanna say I've never seen a time like this before, but I know that our ancestors have. Uh, and so as a result of that, I'm going to say um, that I'm not tired yet. Uh, it is weathering. And so I wanna acknowledge that the work that I do uh, nationally uh, and the work that I have the fortunate opportunity to do at RWJ Barnabas is, is also uh, around policy-led equity change. And I will tell you that the weathering of racism is real. And as you deal with all of this day in and day out, um, it does in fact have, have effect on our health and well-being. And so first of all, thank you for asking, um, but I, because I'm able to work with individuals like yourself at incredible entities, which have also been on the front line, like Deep Free, uh, I wanna say that all is well with my soul. 
So, you know, it's unique that, you know, the position that you sit in, have you had to alter kind of how you're maneuvering personally and professionally, just given all that's going on? Have you had to make any changes into how you approach your work and life? Hmm. Um, I think that I undoubtedly have. Uh, I think that a variety of us are going to have uh, that Chris Cuomo moment. Uh, I quote him because after he overcame COVID, you know, he looked into the camera and said, I'm not certain, right, that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing with the rest of my life. And I think that that lots of individuals may be having that, um, that reflection. And so I've given myself um, the permission and grace to have that inner self-reflection as well. Um, am I indeed on the right path exactly where God intended me to be um, with the, the grace and the mercy that permits us to have lived through the global pandemic to this point and to have witnessed an international revolution about that which quite frankly we have dedicated our livelihood and our work to, to doing, to proving out. Um, and with that, it, it has helped me to uh, kind of double down in reference to uh, what it is that we are doing and why, why we seek upstream systems change to address the social determinants of health, those things that affect us outside of our, of our um, uh, clinical experience, um, and to make certain that we do it through a lens that ensures racial equity. Um, how else have I had to change it? Um, to me, I have to check myself before I am uh, uh, in, in meetings with others, really, because I think that, that most of our colleagues, um, mainstream individuals don't understand, um, uh, understandably so, what it is like to have this happening right now, and to still show up on Zoom meetings and smile and be pleasant and deliver our, our um, uh, project or initiative on time with excellence um, and to nevertheless literally have to read about the fact that they are finding black bodies hanging from trees, that we are seeing others who traditionally never seem to really get it finally stand up and say, listen, wait a minute, we're losing individuals of color for no reason at all, wait a minute, individuals who, for the first time are utilizing terms like structural racism, when just say two years ago, you get a death threat for it, right? So it's a really interesting time. Um, so I have to show up and make certain that I give myself a moment before I enter those spaces, right? To make certain that, that I don't respond through necessarily the hurt that I feel, while still nevertheless ensuring that we are progressing the agenda that we are here to serve to do, right? So I'm gonna switch up my interview a little bit, same questions, but I wanna move the order around a little bit because I think so much of what you said is so timely and so important. Um, I personally am grateful to, to be amongst a team that I don't necessarily have to do the think, the pause before I go forward. But at the same time, I think, you know, not all of us are blessed with that experience. And so, from as a leader, as a leader, um, what do you think businesses and corporations should be considering um, as we go through COVID-19 and social injustice and financial challenges? How would you advise leaders to consider where we are right now in terms of how they engage with their employees from a leadership standpoint? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that I would really um, implore them to ensure that they do not miss this moment that to do so is not just a personal choice, but that if in fact you are in leadership of uh, a team, a unit, an organization, um, your family, quite frankly, right? That you need to ensure that there is not silence because silence is acquiescence with the oppressive nature that has led us here, right? And to fully understand conscientiously that even if they don't intend that, that is the way in which it is being perceived. Right. Um, and so I would encourage them to to really make certain that they are spending the time to figure it out. Right. Do not shoot from the hip. But to make certain that they are speaking to those within their corporate entities uh, and if no one within their corporate entity to others and corporations that have gotten it right to really utilize them as resources so that they understand. So if I attempt to speak to this because you say I need to, how exactly do I do that? Is there a communication tools kit, toolkit? Is there a pathway forward? I should not just call someone and say, hey, really crazy times, huh? Right? Don't do that when my life is always on the line and for the first time now other people are actually understanding that. Um, right? Understand that because you are an operational 
clinical administrative leader that you hold life in the palm of your hand. That the decisions that you are rendering are going to impact not just today, but the livelihood of individuals, not just their career, but their mental status, their physical ability to deal, to navigate, to make it through what is unquestionably a historic time that you are going to play a role in history. So what would I say? I love the fact that there are lots of corporations that have been issuing statements, really important, do not get me wrong. But this is more just than just a one statement issue. And so I am looking forward to not just whether or not you remove the monument or change the logo, but I am also looking at, so what are you doing around providing uh, an assessment to ensure that you do not have a supremacist organizational, um, uh, uh, a supremacist organizational uh, culture embedded within your organization? What equity assessments are you going to be employing over every single organizational and operational decision that needs to be made? How are you reflecting upon the pay and equity within your structure. Uh, how are you, because as you talk to me about how much we matter, I'm going to see how much you actually mean that. And so as a result, is there actually racial equity, um, uh, pay equity across the board? If in fact I look at that with other individuals who have the same title, will I see that reflected among your employees, right? So having a firm understanding that this is what we're looking at, understand that it's not going to be enough to just kind of do the easy win, right? It's really going to be important that there are some fundamental structural changes to how you do business going forward and how you address, quite frankly, the structural inequity that you've contributed to as a result of being a large scale, mid-sized or even small business, right? And so as a result of that, what are you doing in order to actually effectuate um, a change in the historical disenfranchisement, and what are you doing to right size it right now, and how are you literally planning a pathway forward, uh, and what will that look like? Because it's going to need to be transparent. You can't say this today and then turn around and say you won't release that data tomorrow. And how are you making certain that everyone throughout your organization has a firm understanding that this is the train that we are on, and that if they decide that they do not want to include it on their agenda, that this is the train that stops so that they can get off, but it's gonna keep going eventually. Listen, you guys heard it right here. This is why we're talking to this black woman, excellent <laughs> being right here. She just laid it out for our corporate and business leaders. Um, but I'm also on the flip side of that gonna ask, you know, as employees, what would you advise our participants if they are experiencing challenges or needs with their employer as it's related to all that's going on? How do they advocate for themselves in the workplace? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. I, I think a key component to this also has a, a great deal to do with um, making certain that individuals see us not just as resources, um, but also, right, or assets but also making certain that they see us as individuals. Um, I talked earlier about the weathering of racism. This is real, right? This has been evidence-based and evidence research and evidence informed. And so as a result of that, you know, I, I think it's really important that if in fact they need um, a day off, right? They need some extra time that they advocate for that. Go to your HR and ask your human resource officer, um, what are you doing in order to afford uh, uh, your, your African diasporan workers, right? As an employee, I feel especially burdened, right? Or, right, to your direct manager, I have a level of fear and susceptibility that makes me incredibly vulnerable. The fact that African Americans, despite the same contact that you can have with someone who has COVID, we have a likelihood of infection that is five times that of our non-Hispanic white counterparts. And yet everyone wants to rush back to reopening, right? It's really important that they have a few of those facts and that they articulate it in that way to be able to go to their supervisor to say, I really need to talk to someone about the fact that I am uniquely vulnerable to both the pandemic and the pushback to the revolution. And as a result of that, I am interested in better understanding what my place of employment is going to do to ensure my health, well-being, 
and safety, right? OSHA doesn't have guidelines for how to protect you from racism in the workplace, but maybe they should. And so how do they advocate? I really do believe that they're going to have to express a need. If your institution is not holding a series of courageous conversations at exactly right now, you need to literally make certain that you, that you raise the issue with them. And a lot of people are very afraid of um, uh, being retaliated against as a result of that, right? And so that's why we um, document people. And so document there too. I'm sorry to say that, but the, the, the issue of the matter is that I am really concerned about individuals who do not feel empowered enough, right? To be in situations where marginalization is consistent, disenfranchisement is consistent. It pummels you down and it makes you ill, right? They have literally shown that the effects of racism can be felt in the womb. That mothers who experience racism literally have, have unborn children who when born evidence that pain, that, that literally a fetus reacts to a racist incident. And so if we have all of this data, if we know all of this information, then why is it that we are not acting as if it is real? And so one of the things that we have had to do historically as a people is to have the microaggression occur and to just keep on smiling, to keep on going, to keep on treading. And I think now is the time where you get to say, I am flesh and blood. I am bone and heart, and my heart is breaking, and I need the support and assistance that is offered to everyone else. And to make certain that they express that in a manner that reveals our humanity in a culture that is historically, as a country, denied it. I told you guys, you're going to get it all from Micheline. I, I appreciate so much the level of heart that you bring to who you are as a person, but also as a professional, as an executive. We don't often get to see that. Um, it's very rare that we get to see us in the C-suites first and foremost, but then when we get there to still be able to be us and you understand exactly what I'm saying and really be able to connect with that, our experience as women, our experience as African-American women, um, especially in a time as this. And so I really just, I appreciate and respect so much um, of who you are and where you sit. Um, and thank you so much for sharing so much of who you are with our audience. Um, I want to finish up a little bit today and really talk about what you all are doing at Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health, um, RWJBH, um, around helping your employees through this period, because you get, again, are on the front lines. So what are you guys doing to help the teams, you know, move through, whether it's on the, on the health side, whether it's on the racial disparity side, um, what's going on at RWJBH that you guys can talk about today? Yes, so happy to. Um, uh, under the direction of our president and CEO at the System 11, Bar Barry Ostrowski, we have literally, during the, the midst of COVID, we really tried to pivot very quickly to ensure that we were meeting the felt needs of our frontline workers. Um, everything from um, literally offering uh, an on-site embedding um, uh, uh, mini grocery stores so that our frontline workers wouldn't have to worry about, you know, being in that environment all day and then having to, to, to run home, but having to, to uh, literally stop to get, you know, milk or eggs or anything else. So we brought that on, on site so that they would have that opportunity and still be able to take care of themselves and their families to literally creating um, uh, safe spaces, right? Uh, zen rooms and, and zen spaces, filling them with, with natural light and plants and others in order to say, listen, your well being is important too. Uh, there were a lot of talking heads at the time of the height of the pandemic saying, well, you know, th this is what they signed up for. No one signed up for this. No one signed up to fight an alien that we cannot see that we've never known and that we do not understand. No one has signed up for that. And so I wanna be clear about that. But in addition to that, we've also really tried to strive to increase communication, um, utilize telehealth and telemental health. Um, there was a fantastic initiative pushed out by a team of, of colleagues called Connect Together, which um, really was in order to ensure that individuals knew that, that 
that there are a, a litany of resources available to them. I implore people all the time, please utilize them. Everything from helpful videos on our intranet um, to the ability to utilize an app to connect to someone who's a mental health provider, right? Um, someone who's going to check in with you daily. How are you today? Um, you know, the human body is really interesting. Oftentimes when we go through a trauma, you, you're able to go through it, but then later on, right, you kind of have that, that breakdown. So we timed it in such a way that it would be right about around that time that science has told us that that happens. Um, we've increased wellness and behavioral health services and um, uh, flexibility and, and remote work environment. Um, but also around the issues of what we're talking about, around uh, issues of social justice and, and the national debate. Uh, we participated in, in a, a system-wide uh, white Coat Black Lives event. Um, we've also had a series of courageous conversations happening at our facilities, led by our uh, Department of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, led up by, by another colleague of mine. Um, so we really tried to make certain that we didn't miss this point in history, that we didn't stand outside and act as if everything were just okay. That's big. That's really big. Um, I think the mental health health thing is huge. Um, white coats and black lives. That just sounds powerful um, in and of itself. So I do applaud you all for that work. Um, the last thing I'll focus on, because I wouldn't be D free if I didn't. Um, you all are actually one of our first corporate partners to adopt D free programming for your employees. And I want to talk a little bit about not just that you're using the platform, but why you all felt that that was something um, important to offer to your teams. Absolutely. First of all, uh, the D-free um, programmatic elements are second to none. They are um, incredibly relevant. Um, they meet individuals where they are. Um, they are not presumptuous about what individuals know. And so as a result of that, they help to bridge them to where they should be um, without offering any kind of condescension around what they do or do not know. A lot of financial tools tend to be very presumptuous, and I've noticed that. Um, but quite frankly, financial health and, and um, uh, physical health are so intricately intertwined. It's a natural for us. Um, uh, it's always important. It's always relevant. There have literally been studies which evidence out literally the incredible importance there and that tie. There have been everything from the Academy of Pediatrics to uh, a publication uh, in an Illinois uh, University uh, uh, health journal about the fact that being in a situation of having um, uh, financial stress leads to high blood pressure, weight gain, high blood sugar, diabetes, heart palpitations, stomach pain. I mean, it goes on ulcers. It goes on and on and on. So for us, that was just a very natural uh, connection that merely had to be made. Um, what D3 has also done for us is to open up the dialogue so that we can think more creatively and more innovatively around how we even pay our employees. So as a result of that, we went from just utilizing paychecks to literally utilizing uh, uh, debit cards so that individuals are not right having to utilize check cashing places and, and um, literally dealing with predatory interest rates um, because of the fact that they may have not grown up in an environment where um, uh, banking was discussed at the dinner table. Um, it's, it's given us an opportunity to take a look at who plans for retirement and who doesn't. And one of the things we found out is that our lower income individuals tend not to. So how do we do something on a retirement sleeve to make certain that they're not harmed? Um, even down to um, uh, trying to ward against predatory payday loans. So D3 for us has opened up uh, really uh, an entire season of ensuring that individuals really have pathways of up out of transgenerational poverty and literally are landing in places where transgenerational wealth is possible. I promise I'm hiring you for your one-liners when this is all said and done. There's so many gems, so many gems. And you know, I could talk to you forever, um, but we are on a limited schedule. But the one thing I do want to ask um, before we close out is, what message would you like to leave with our participants to help them move from crisis to clarity um, as we navigate today's world? Yeah. So I would love to be able to say to them that A, you are not alone. That everyone is going through this with you. That there are tools and resources that are made available to you 
uh, through what D Free is doing, that the pressure that you feel today, that tomorrow is coming, and to please hold on, that your health and well being is really the most important thing. And so, if you have that, right, then a brighter tomorrow is possible. Right. Um, I would really want to make certain that they understand that what this is, is a season for them to get prepared for whatever the next season is. Right. No one knew that we were going to be here, but we are and that there's purpose and intention in that. I promise them that they are intended to make it. Listen, well, thank you so much for your time today. Truly an honor. I appreciate your transparency. I appreciate your investment. I pray that you continue to grow personally and professionally and just stand your ground and continue to be who you are. You're such a bright light. And I'm thankful to have you on the RWJBH team. You're an incredible advocate. Miss Micheline Davis Esquire, everyone. Thank you.